All right, folks, it's 1230. Doctors, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. That's uh, uh, Brent Rusin, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. Um, wanted to provide a bit of an update in our, our current uh, epidemiology. Uh, Manitoba, we're continuing to see a significant uh, amount of spread of COVID-19 in the community. And uh, of course, as we discussed in the past, the, the numbers we're able to report um, are a significant underestimate of uh, the amount of uh, test positives uh, occurring each day. Uh, what we're reporting is including those uh, PCR tests and then a, and then a fraction uh, of the uh, rapid tests. Uh, so we also look at other indicators, uh, hospital and ICU uh, uh, information. And so at this point, we do see that uh, hospitalization rates are, are high, uh, although stable. Uh, and the same goes with uh, with ICU admissions at this uh, at this point. Like other jurisdictions, we have been receiving reports from the National Microbiology Lab uh, focused on wastewater monitoring uh, that provides a, an indicator to uh, COVID levels in the population. Uh, well, this information, like any uh, data we receive, we don't use it in isolation. Um, there are studies that have shown this wastewater data to be uh, and, uh, good early indicator to identify new strains, uh, but also showing increasing or decreasing uh, volumes of transmission. Uh, the data for Manitoba, uh, which is focused only on Winnipeg, uh, did uh, signal early on uh, that uh, there was a potential peak in early January. Um, however, since then, we haven't seen a dramatic decline and seen uh, quite a variable level since that time. So we do have to uh, uh, keep a close eye on that uh, on that information, and again, that's only one piece of the information that we're looking. At. So it's still early uh, to describe at uh, where definitively we are in this uh, in this wave. We do know for sure that the virus is very much uh, present in our communities and and circulating. And so that means it's still important for uh, for everyone to uh, to do what they can to protect themselves and the people around them from. Uh, from Omicron. Uh, most importantly, that is getting vaccinated, getting vaccinated with the uh, uh, dose that you are immediately eligible for as soon as, uh, as possible. It's still the best way to protect ourselves and the, and the people around us. Um, we all need to monitor very closely for symptoms. Very, very mild symptoms should uh, have us uh, uh, isolating. Uh, certainly seeking testing at the earliest opportunity if you are at, uh, uh, at higher risk. Uh, because we do have treatment options uh, available, uh, but everyone needs to be monitoring for symptoms and taking action uh, should even mild symptoms uh, develop. Um, of course, those who have symptoms or who test positive should be uh, uh, notifying their uh, contacts so that they can be extra diligent with monitoring for their symptoms. But we continue to see uh, quite a significant benefit to being vaccinated, uh, especially that uh, after that third dose, uh, even with Omicron, it provides a significant benefit um, against severe outcome, that uh, being hospital uh, hospitalization, ICU admission, and death. So again, all these measures help us uh, protect ourselves and the people around us. Uh, last week, we were updating Manitobans about the approval of Paxlovid and oral uh, antiviral uh, used to treat COVID-19. Uh, we have received a, a shipment of 1,100 uh, uh, treatment doses. Um, the eligibility for this is similar to that of the monoclonal antibody treatment. Uh, and uh, the website is updated with all this uh, information. But again, the uh, main uh, point here is that uh, this is not a substitution for vaccination. It's not a substitution for uh, following all the fundamentals. But uh, those that are at higher risk, uh, this is another tool uh, available to prevent those severe outcomes. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, treatment has to be started very early. Uh, so treatment has to be started within five days of uh, symptom onset. So this means very close observation of symptoms, uh, early uh, testing, and then access to treatment is what will uh, uh, decrease that likelihood of severe outcomes uh, for higher risk uh, uh, individuals. So please, if you uh, uh, are experiencing symptoms and you're in those higher risk categories, uh, do get tested right away and, um, uh, and receive treatment as, as soon as possible. 
So in response to Omicron, we've already changed our testing processes and uh, case and contact management for schools and in the community. Uh, we're now going to be putting similar changes in place for the early learning and the child care centers. Um, and this will come into effect this Friday. Uh, because Omicron, we know a sole transmissible child care centers will, will no longer be required to follow up with public health on all cases or identify close contacts. Uh, staff, family, um, home child care providers should continue to monitor daily for symptoms before attending either a child uh, center, child care center, or a home based child care facility. Uh, children or staff exposed to COVID 19 uh, in the child care and school setting may continue to attend. Uh, uh, child care and school if they remain asymptomatic, but again, very close monitoring for symptoms. Uh, child care centers will monitor absenteeism and numbers of positive test results uh, reported by staff and families. Uh, if there's a significant increase in COVID-19 in, in a cohort, they can connect with uh, local public health offices for additional guidance. Public health will continue to monitor the overall number of cases confirmed by PCR testing or other lab-based tests in child care centers. And we may contact a facility uh, if we see more COVID in the center uh, beyond what is occurring in the community. Additionally, child care centers will no longer be required to identify close contacts and it's no longer recommended that they distribute the notifications for individual cases. Licensed child care home providers should follow the same guidance for notifying contacts that applies to all other Manitobans. We're recommending that centers regularly communicate with families about absenteeism and a number of cases in the past 14 days connected to their facility. Uh, more information is going to licensed child care facilities today and further details about the changes uh, uh, being, uh, being put in place. As most of you already know, today is Bell uh, Let's Talk Day. As we all have uh, come to know, the pandemic is not just affecting our, our physical health, it's having a profound effect on uh, uh, mental health as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we all should uh, ensure we are, are paying attention to our, our own mental health. So we should reach out to family and friends who may need to support, uh, may need our, uh, our support. Uh, today is a good reminder uh, to talk about that. Uh, so the pandemic has affected us all in many different ways. I know uh, for myself, I've uh, had to lean on, on family and friends during many difficult times. I've reached out to many friends and, and uh, family members to ensure uh, they are doing well and I encourage all uh, Manitobans to uh, consider doing the same. Uh, there are resources online at manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 that might be helpful uh, to yourself or someone you care about. Uh, so remember to be uh, to uh, be kind to yourself and to others uh, during these very difficult, uh, difficult times. So uh, uh, thank you. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Dr. Reimer. Thank you, Dr. Rusin. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Joss Reimer, the medical lead for Manitoba's Vaccine Implementation Task Force. So it's been quite cold lately, and when the weather is like this, our thoughts often focus on the people in our communities who may not have a stable place to call home. We recognized uh, in earlier um, iterations of the campaign how important it was to reach out to individuals who don't have reliable housing with trusted partners to reduce barriers and ensure that they feel comfortable and have access to the vaccine. Many people who uh, are living in shelters now are eligible for their third dose. And so that's why we have vaccination teams who are meeting people where they're at. So in Winnipeg, uh, this has meant visits to a few shelters in Decem December to give third dose boosters, along with a partnership between some community organizations and the urban indigenous sites to support any ongoing needs. The approach varied in other regions, based on how they could best meet the needs of these folks in other communities. But it did include vaccines being brought to shelters wherever possible, vaccine clinics at some local food banks, near alternative isolation sites, and the vaccine being offered through trusted community organizations or other sites that work with vulnerable people offering transportation to existing clinics. In Southern Health, for example, Shelters and other community organizations supported their clients 
by helping to coordinate transportation to vaccine sites. The shelter-based vaccine program is just one example of the many ways that we are continuously working to ensure accessibility for Manitobans. We want everyone in the province to have the opportunity to receive timely and convenient protection from the virus. It's hard to get an exact tally of how many doses were given because of these outreach efforts, because they varied so much from community to community. But we do know that every dose is important, especially for people who uh, are experiencing homelessness, and especially now to help prevent severe outcomes from Omicron. People who are experiencing housing insecurity often have multiple um, health conditions that put them in a position where it's not only more likely that they could contract the virus, but more likely that they could become seriously ill. So I wanted to take a moment today to thank the teams in all parts of the province that have done this great work to reach out to this sector and make sure that uh, people who are experiencing homelessness still have access. I would also today like to provide a quick uh, update on the vaccine program that's well underway in our schools. So nearly 60 in-school clinics are scheduled for this week plus more than a dozen after-school clinics. So over 15,000 doses have been given through our school-based clinics so far, and that's from September to January. Nearly 9,700 of these doses have been given to kids age five to 11. Because the school clinics are accessible and close to people's homes, adults have been visiting the after-school clinics as well. In fact, uh, nearly 4,300 people over the age of 18 have received a dose at a school. So if you are a parent or a guardian who has not yet taken your child to be vaccinated uh, or to get their second dose, please do so as soon as possible and as soon as they're eligible for that second dose. If there is an up upcoming vaccine clinic in your child's school, I would encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. Currently, children in the 5 to 11 age group are lagging a bit behind in their uptake of this, uh, the vaccine so far uh, and are only beginning to get their second doses. So we need to get the numbers higher in this group. We really want to protect all of the children in Manitoba. So just as a reminder, your child is eligible to receive their second dose eight weeks after the first dose, unless they live in a First Nations community, in which case it's three weeks after the first dose. Overwhelmingly, the research and real-time scientific evidence has demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of the pediatric vaccine. In fact, just this week, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization strengthened their recommendations for the vaccine in the 5 to 11 age group. So based on the safety and effectiveness reports that have been produced both before and after the rollout began, NACI now strongly recommends this two-dose series for the 5 to 11 age group. Moving on to older youth, as you know, we have been closely following the National Advisory Committee on Immunization's recommendations throughout the pandemic. And we've been waiting on word about a recommendation for a third dose or booster dose for um, people aged 12 to 17. This has not happened yet. Uh, we do wanna to recognize today though that it is possi possible that NACI will not recommend a third dose for this age group. So I wanted to talk about that for a second. NACI would only recommend a third dose if it was deemed clinically justified. And by that, I mean that there is a benefit to young people in having a third dose. This means that they need to do an analysis of whether or not this younger group may get sufficient protection against COVID from their first two doses, because they're younger, because they have fewer risks for severe outcomes, and generally speaking, a stronger immune response. I know last week I discussed concerns that we have regarding long COVID, and I wanted to provide some reassurance to parents that most of the concerning data so far around the world regarding long COVID refers to risks for adults. Overall, it appears that children have a lower risk of long COVID compared to adults, but we still have a lot to learn about long COVID and we need to continue watching the data as it's developed. So I will keep you informed as I know more, but regardless of what NACI says for third dose recommendations for teens, I do wanna reinforce the importance of them getting their first and second dose when they're eligible. 
as we're seeing more people in the province with COVID, I also wanted to provide a brief reminder about when to get your next vaccine after you've tested positive. Even if you've recently had COVID, it's still important for you to get your next dose of vaccine once you're no longer isolating and no longer have symptoms. While a COVID infection is expected to provide some immunity, we have much better data showing that the vaccine provides better and longer lasting protection. We know that being fully vaccinated uh, and for many people getting your booster will help protect you from more severe outcomes if you happen to be infected again. So it's really important that, we, that you give yourself the best chance of being protected against this virus. And finally, to add to what Dr. Rusin said uh, on Bell Let's Talk Day, I am so grateful that Manitobans are again being encouraged to open up about mental health, to support one another, to normalize these important conversations. Mental health is health. The brain is a vital part of the body and to function well, it needs rest from stress. We need ad adequate sleep. We need food, empathy, compassion help from others. We need so many things to be healthy, including our mental health. This pandemic has clearly harmed uh, our collective health and we've all experienced a lot of stress and a lot of mental strain related to the pandemic. I know I have, I know Dr. Rusin has, and I know that most, if not all of you have as well. So, you know, I wanna encourage everyone to support each other, to try to find ways to recover, to refresh, to do everything that you can to support other people, to be kind and gentle with others, but also to be kind and gentle with yourself. We, we know that Manitoba has some mental wellness supports. Dr. Rusin mentioned the website already. So I really do ask that if you are struggling right now, that you reach out. Often when you're struggling, reaching out feels like the hardest thing in the world to do, but you know, we still want you to use the resources we have available or reach out to friends and family or someone else who's trusted in your life. And if you're someone who uh, is worried about someone else, you know, reach out to them. Make sure that they're doing okay and, and offer to be a support to anyone in your life who may be struggling. So with that, uh, we will take questions. Thank you, doctors. A reminder to our reporters on this Zoom session, you will have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this afternoon from CTV Winnipeg, Michelle. Hi, Dr. Rusin. I wanted to ask you a little bit about some polling that shows about half of people who think if they caught the Omicron virus, it would have a serious but a manageable symptoms, while a third of people think their infection would be mild. What do you say to people who aren't necessarily as worried about Omicron right now? Well, you know, we certainly see that there is a, uh, a change with it, with this variant on that level of severity. Um, but uh, it's still something that we all need to take quite serious, especially those that are uh, at significant risk. Um, so we still know vaccine is our best protection against severe outcome. Uh, so that's probably the, the biggest um, recommendation I would have to to all of these people who are, who are taking this poll is to ensure you are up to date on all the eligible vaccines. Um, otherwise, uh, many people will have mild symptoms, uh, but many people still have severe symptoms. We still have many Manitobas in hospital. We have many uh, in ICU. And unfortunately, you, you see the list of Manitobans that we um, announce uh, every day that have uh, have died related to COVID-19. So um, so it's still a virus that we need to be very um, uh, alert uh, to uh, and take as many steps as possible to protect ourselves and the people around us uh, from this. Is the province giving any consideration to loosening measures for large gatherings or lifting capacity limits for theaters, concert halls, or entertainment venues? We know that the current uh, orders are going to expire in a few days here. Yeah, so we'll have a, a pending announcement on our next steps. Uh, certainly all these measures are always considered um, um, continually uh, on what we, what we need to do the, to best protect the overall health of Manitobans. And so there'll be more to come on, on the restrictions in the, in the coming days. 
from CHVN. Taylor. Hi. On that note, um, obviously, the, the orders do expire quite soon. What kind of things should Manitobans be expecting? Yeah, so at, at this point, I think you expect some further information uh, on that. Um, we, once we have a uh, definitive uh, decision, uh, we'll make that announcement. So right now, the Manitobans can expect to uh, hear in the near future what our what our plans are. Uh, should Manitobans be planning on making changes to gatherings or if they're business owners, should they be wondering what's going on next week? Yeah, we're going to have more uh, more to offer on that in the near future. And so just like any um, iteration of these orders, we always w- want to ensure we're uh, providing notice uh, to Manitobans. And so uh, should be expecting some more uh, information shortly. From the Winnipeg Free Press, Katie. Good afternoon. I have some questions for Dr. Rusin. Um, why isn't the wastewater data being released in Manitoba? Yeah, so that is something that's uh, being worked on. Um, it was just uh, just the nature of the uh, of uh, um, uh, how we we're receiving this data that that Winnipeg's just wasn't. Uh, being published uh, as part of a, uh, uh, like many other cities are. So we're working with the um, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada to, to be able to get that uh, published as well. Okay, and will the province reopen PCR testing to the public? We're seeing only around 2000 tests conducted a day now. Um, so why not expand eligibility? So what to, what we really need to do is start uh, moving towards our, our long-term uh, measures uh, with COVID. So what's really important is we want people who um, uh, to test who are uh, at first eligible for treatment. So that's really where we want uh, testing to lead to. So a test and treat uh, process to this. Um, we're still testing, so we can still do sequencing and, and find new variants and things. So that's why we, we still have access to this testing. But for the most part, um, we uh, really want people who are at high risk, who are gonna possibly be eligible for treatment to have access to quick testing um, so we can get that treatment in their, in their hands. From Global News, Rosanna. As you mentioned, Dr. Rusin, we, we, we have some information from wastewater testing, but since PCR testing is, is very limited at the moment, a lot of people are still feeling they don't know how big the risk of COVID is, especially I'm thinking some people who are isolating because they're just at uh, risk of more severe outcomes, even though they're vaccinated. So can you give us a sense of where we are on the curve and your reasoning behind that? Yeah, and so we look at a number of things, you know, our test positivity, the, the, the trend in the PCR, wastewater, hospitalizations, all of these things. So it, it's really difficult to give a definitive um, uh, course on that. Uh, if we look at where other jurisdictions are and, and the timing of that and put a lot of the, these pieces together, it looks like uh, um, uh, it is possible we're nearing a peak. Um, or a plateau in Manitoba, it's very difficult to pinpoint those type of things. But uh, looking at all of our, our data, that's uh, um, what's leading us to think that we're, we're nearing that peak um, uh, in, the, in the coming week or so. Thank you. Dr. Reimer, about six months ago, around 70% of Manitobans had received two doses of a vaccine. So why do you think third dose uptake is lagging so far behind? I think right, right now we're at 39%. Yeah, I think there's. It's challenging to evaluate the risk for individuals. So you know, we really want people who are over the age of fifty, or those people who have health conditions that put them at higher risk, to get that booster. And a lot of Manitobans don't necessarily see themselves as at higher risk, but even something like diabetes puts you at higher risk. You know, most people over fifty will have a health condition. Uh, that adds to the risk on top of just the age base alone. And even those who are under 50, many of us have health conditions that put us at higher risk. So, you know, I do ask Manitobans to think about, you know, what medications do you take? What do you see a doctor for? And if you're taking a medication, it means you have a health condition that might be putting you at higher risk and, and means that you could end up in the hospital if you were infected, even if you've received two doses. 
So, you know, if it's been more than five months for those people over 50 or more than six months for others, and you have any sort of condition, including age, uh, that puts you at that higher risk, now is the time to go. We want you to be protected. We want you to stay out of the hospital. Uh, and we want to protect the hospital resources as well so that whenever any of us need them for COVID or anything else, that those uh, beds are available. From the Brandon Sun, Karen. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just getting back to the wastewater, um, even though the data hasn't uh, not being released to the public, it, I'm assuming you've seen it. So uh, when you say that we're declining, uh, but not enough uh, to say that if we're past a peak, how uh, what kind of metrics do you have to say that, yes, we are having a significant decline and we're going to end up in a certain at a certain rate at a certain time? Well, so that's a, a variety of, uh, of indicators that we look at. So we certainly don't have, you know, any indicators that are clearly telling us that we're in a decline right now. Uh, we talked about the wastewater and, and um, uh, that indicated that there was a, uh, a, a peak in early January. But since then, we haven't seen a dramatic decline, more of a plateau, but a lot of variability in, in those numbers. So we always have to be cautious in our interpretation of that. Uh, but we'll be looking at, uh, you know, most notably the hospital and ICU admissions, uh, as well as some other indicators. We still use test positivity. Um, there are certain um, uh, sectors such as healthcare, which do uh, frequent testing, so we can follow some trends. On we'll be following all these indicators, and, um, and like I say, when we have a, a more definitive answer from those indicators, and we'll provide that. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, this is more a question for Dr. Reimer. Just saying about the uh, trying to get a uh, third dose and saying that that might not happen for teenagers. Uh, but just in your opinion, as a doctor, would you like to see a third dose be offered to these young people? Yeah, and to be clear, I haven't seen any report from NASI one way or the other about whether or not they're gonna be recommending um, booster doses for teenagers. Uh, just wanted Manitobans to um, recognize that they, they may not recommend it. Um, it's, uh, their job to look at the evidence really carefully to determine what's the most beneficial option for everybody in Canada. So, you know, I don't have any particular wish um, one way or the other. What I want is for um, that scientific evaluation to occur so that we can provide Manitobans with the best possible information and advice about what we know about the risks and benefits of it, the vaccine, whether it's a booster dose or any other dose. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from NASI uh, about what their evaluation found, uh, and we'll be sharing that with Manitobans as soon as um, it is provided to us. From CJOB, Skyler. Hi there, guys. Thanks uh, for taking our questions. Just to follow up to uh, Rosanna's uh, second question and then uh, the answers to that that you provided. Uh, either of you feel free to take this one. I know you're not in the hospital setting day in and day out like uh, some of the folks we do have access to, uh, but I did want to get your opinion on how uh, what we're seeing in hospitals right now compares to, you know, say a bad flu season. Uh, I just find that a lot of folks are, uh, you know, seeing these numbers, uh, you know, now over 700 COVID uh, related hospitalizations and it, uh, you know, without the context, it, it's just kind of a large number to a lot of people. Yeah, so I can uh, uh, try to address that. So uh, it is right as, as we start to, um, uh, you know, transition our response to Omicron, which Omicron has really forced our hand to change the way we, uh, we deal with, uh, with COVID. Um, we have to look at the uh, the strains on healthcare systems. There's no doubt that there's a, a significant strain on healthcare system uh, at this point. Uh, we do know we report overall uh, COVID uh, numbers in hospital, and and we're going to be working on trying to provide the uh, the breakdown of those with COVID infection that are there um, due uh, to COVID infection rather than 
happen to be there for another reason and happen to test positive for COVID. So we're working on trying to uh, provide that uh, that further update. Um, and then, of course, there'll be a significant proportion of, uh, of those individuals that are uh, admitted due uh, to COVID because we do know there's still a significant strain. Uh, but then in other years, there's you know a significant number of people admitted to hospital also with uh, uh, the respiratory viruses uh, such as influenza, RSV, um, that we just haven't seen high numbers uh, in, in this um, uh, season or last season. So, uh, so it all has to be taken into context. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, you know overall, it, it's clear that the healthcare system has been under strain. Um, have um, uh, that relates to staffing issues as well because of the widespread transmission of Omicron. So, we're going to try to be uh, providing a, a clear. Uh, uh, numbers on the actual uh, uh, COVID-related uh, admissions, um, but for now, it's it, it's clear we still have that strain in the system. Thank you for that. And then, just to um, expand on that a little bit, I've been looking at the new inpatient admissions on the um, GeoPortal site, and you know, they average probably in the last week around the 40-50 mark. And uh, folks, uh, you know, within the health industry say the the turnover rate does take quite a toll on resources um, because you know switching out beds is a little more difficult than you know keeping the same person in a bed. So, is this turnover rate similar to what you would see in a in a so-called regular uh, respiratory virus season, or is this a bit higher? Yeah, that's a tough for me to uh, to answer on that. I don't have all that information. I think what we do know is that with with Omicron, we're seeing the length of stay um, uh, uh, on average being shorter uh, than Delta and, and previous uh, variants. So we are seeing that shorter length of stay, which could um, uh, explain some of this higher turnover. From the Winnipeg Sun, Ryan. Hi, uh, appreciate the time. Um, we've seen in Quebec uh, restrictions on big box stores for, like, you know, requiring a vaccine and, and for cannabis and liquor stores. Is that something uh, Manitoba would be at all considering in the future? So we've, uh, like I say, we continually review our, our restrictions and um, uh, and which way we need to go uh, with them and consider all sort of uh, 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 various options. At this point, those are not uh, something that uh, is uh, on the table. Um, but uh, like I say, things change and we'll be following things closely and uh, we'll have to uh, adjust uh, depending on what the uh, what we see in the, in the community. Okay, and I know this may be tough to answer, but with so many cases uh, in Manitoba, um, how many are we seeing that are reinfections? Is that common or are we, are we seeing everyone kind of get new COVID, I suppose. So I don't have a, a definitive uh, answer for that. It is very difficult right now, given the amount of um, rapid tests that are that are occurring that are not reported. What we'll say is from, uh, from what we do know and from other jurisdictions, that's a, a very low uh, number of, of reinfections. From CBC Radio Canada, Julia. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to go back to uh, some point that because my connection broke up. Um, did you say that you will stop following the cases in daycares like you did in schools? If so, why and when this is starting? It is starting this Friday and we're going to have the similar uh, case and contact management or the same uh, case and contact management as we had in schools. Uh, so not uh, necessarily... Uh, responding to single cases with uh, various uh, case investigations. And, and again, the, the change is made from Omicron. It's so much more infectious, has such a shorter um, uh, incubation period that case and contact uh, uh, management is just not effective. Uh, so we have to uh, change our approach to it. We talk about uh, mental health and how this restriction are uh, really affecting people live right now. At the same time, we seem like we are a lot of hard time to finding the, the perfect indicators and the clear indicators for people to say where we at in this pandemic here in Manitoba. What would you have to say to people that because we don't have any cases like clear cases number, we have number of like for the wastewater, for example, but we can't really rely on them that much. Do you maybe think of a clear indicator that you could maybe provide to people? 
And so again, we, we've never had uh, sort of one indicator that tells us everything. Uh, we continue to follow uh, many of ours and, and uh, right now the, the most important uh, indicators and, and has been for quite some time is, uh, is that strain on the healthcare system. And so right now we're looking at our hospitalizations and ICU admissions, which seem uh, to be stabilizing at this point. Uh, so again, it's very early uh, to make any conclusions on that. Um, but uh, that is what we're seeing currently. And so we'll continue to follow that. And, um, you know, we'll have more to offer on, uh, on the details of further restrictions uh, in the near future. From CBC Manitoba, Bart. Hi, Dr. Rusin. Furthermore, on the wastewater, you stated we saw a peak early in January, a decline a little bit later, and then sort of a plateau. But can you give us a little bit more uh, actual quantification here? When you say, uh, uh, what average level would that later plateau be in relation to that peak earlier in January? Yeah, and, and so this is, it's a lot of variability there. So I, I, we are working on it so that can this just be uh, published and, and, and people can, uh, or would be able to see it. Uh, but uh, what we saw is what would be reported as a, as a peak, a high sort of watermark in, uh, in early January. Uh, but since then, the, the numbers have been just uh, fluctuating right around that mark. Uh, so we didn't really see a significant decline um, and uh, and uh, and a lot of uh, fluctuation of those numbers. So that's why it's a, you know it's one indicator. We're not able to rely on it because we're seeing a lot of uh, fluctuation over time. All right. Speaking of indicators, uh, earlier this month the province expanded its PCR testing capacity, hiring another lab. Yet we're not seeing testing numbers uh, rise alongside that. In fact, we're, we're testing fewer people than we did weeks and weeks ago. So knowing that, seeing that, why aren't you allowing more people to get PCR tests? So, I mean, the big, big reason is we were testing, um, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, for reason, uh, you know, and we're testing right now to, uh, to ensure we have uh, uh, people diagnosed in a timely manner to receive treatment if they're, um, uh, eligible for that. So really we're, we're shifting that over time. Um, we're young, healthy people who have mild symptoms don't necessarily need to rush out and get tested. You can stay home and, and isolate. Um, we want those tests available for, uh, for people who are going to be eligible for treatment um, so we can have a rapid turnaround of those tests. And, um, and right now uh, that, uh, uh, that is meeting that, uh, that demand from the Canadian press, Steve. Hi, Dr. Rusin. Um, just wondering about the BA2 variant. Uh, is Manitoba seeing much of it, if, if any, and what's being done in terms of monitoring for it? So we haven't had uh, this uh, reported uh, in Manitoba at this time. Uh, we still are sequencing, and, and uh, at this point, that will have to be picked up by sequencing. Our, our, our screening wouldn't uh, uh, pick pick this up. So um, we still sequence in, in certain um, settings. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, we are looking, uh, looking for this variant in that uh, respect. Okay. And, and I just want to make sure I heard you right. You, you haven't seen a case yet in, in Manitoba, correct? I haven't uh, had this uh, reported to me yet. So. Okay. Um, and you've been asked a lot of questions about, about, um, uh, possible changes to the public health orders. Um, are, are you still being supported by the government? Do you feel you're being listened to? Yeah, uh, public health works quite closely with, uh, um, uh, you know, with uh, with government on this. So certainly, we've uh, always been at the table providing our advice and um, have always felt that uh, our you know, advice has been listened to. From CBC National News, Cameron. Sorry, I had a little trouble unmuting there. Hi, uh, Dr. Rusin. Just, um, you were talking about indicators uh, earlier, you know, looking at... Um, <clears throat> the ICU admissions, the hospital admissions, 
I suspect you're also looking at absenteeism in the healthcare system right now um, due to fatigue and uh, infection within the system. Just wondering if any of this kind of highlights a basic a level of strain that the system was even under before COVID. Uh, is this highlighting you know, basically a, uh, you know, I guess an inability to maintain a uh, uh, hard pace over the long term here? So I think certainly the amount of uh, uh, transmission that's uh, occurring is, is putting strain on the system. And then you add to that the absenteeism uh, issue. So uh, so there is that uh, additional strain to the system. As far as how this relates to, you know, to the overall capacity healthcare system, um, that's not going to be for me to comment on that, uh, you know, can, uh, can direct that uh, perhaps to shared health if, if they may have a comment on that. Great. That's all my questions. From La Liberté, Vincent. Good afternoon. I have a request about the COVID-19 data that are being reported online on the website of the government of Manitoba. Uh, first of all, can you remind how the positive cases are currently being reported by the government of Manitoba? Uh, so what makes up uh, the, the numbers in those positive cases? So it is the, the positive uh, lab-based uh, PCR tests. And then there are certain uh, uh, sectors uh, that uh, are reporting positive uh, rapid tests. So uh, for the most part, the, the rapid tests that are done at home uh, are not part of those numbers. And so uh, the, the positive PCR tests done in a lab make up the, the largest proportion of those reported numbers. Okay, my second question is related to the rapid test. Uh, as mentioned, Dr. Jazz at Wall on January 5th, uh, the positive cases on rapid test are mostly not uh, being reported at the moment. Is that going to change? No, that's not likely to, uh, to change. Uh, again, what we're testing for now is uh, mostly uh, for treatment. So we want people to be able to have uh, access to, uh, to testing, especially if they're high risk, to have a rapid turnaround on those tests, uh, to be able to seek treatment within that relatively small treatment window. Uh, and so that's really the purpose of testing that we're shifting to. Um, we still do PCR. Uh, we're still going to continue to do PCR because we need that to be able to sequence because uh, we still want to be able to do the um, uh, you know, surveillance in that manner. Um, but the, the reporting of the home uh, rapid tests are, are not likely to change. From the Nipawa Banner and Press, Ken. Hi, can you hear me now? Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking our questions. We've, uh, you've indicated and other sources have indicated that there is some protection from uh, uh, COVID-19 after having been infected. Uh, do you foresee the day when people who have had COVID but who are not vaccinated may be allowed to attend venues, restaurants, uh, and other currently restricted locations? You know, at, at this point, that's not uh, that. That's something that's uh, in the works right now. Um, you know, people who have uh, been uh, infected, we still want to, them to receive vaccination. Uh, we see a tremendous boost of their immune system um, uh, when they receive a vaccine after they've recovered from infection. So we still want to encourage that. Um, and uh, you know, right now, this is uh, uh, we still have. Uh, plans to maintain that proof of vaccine uh, concept uh, for the time being. And my follow-up question is that is uh, after a person has had COVID, uh, how long, and I'm, I've talked to a couple of different people in authority, but I would want to check with you what the official word is, how long should they wait after the COVID symptoms have passed before they get their vaccination? So there's no hard and fast rule about how long people have to wait after an infection. What is critical is that they no longer be infectious. So certainly if people still have symptoms, we would ask them to wait and not come to one of the vaccine clinics 
until those symptoms have resolved. But after the symptoms have resolved, after they complete their uh, period of isolation, they could come anytime after that to receive uh, the vaccine. There was very early in the campaign advice to wait three months after infection before going for a vaccine. But that was due to the short supply of vaccine that we had at that time. And so we wanted to provide the vaccine to people who had no immunity uh, rather than providing it to people who had potentially some immunity because of an infection. That is no longer the case. We have um, adequate supply of mRNA vaccines. So we don't want people to wait three months between an infection and getting their next dose. So like I said, there's no hard and fast rule. Just make sure that you have recovered uh, and don't wait months. All right, folks, we have time for a few more questions. Please proceed. Dr. Reeson, it's part of the key this year. Forgive me, you didn't answer my, my second question. Uh, if we have more testing capacity now, why are we testing fewer people, about 2,000 a day, than we were weeks ago? Well, a lot of that is based on the demand for, for that. So we have uh, we want to have that uh, PCR testing available uh, for, like I said, for uh, mostly high risk people who we can offer treatment to. Uh, many people are um, uh, taking advantage of the uh, rapid testing at home, and so uh, a lot of that is just based on on the demand. How many people are showing up for uh, for testing? It doesn't match up with what people are saying. But uh, completely different question: What uh, proportion of our COVID deaths in the months of January? Have been Delta and how and what have been Omicron? Yeah, I don't have that uh, um, in front of me. We can we can look at that. A lot of times, it's it's difficult uh, because that requires the you know the, the sequencing of, of results. But um, we'll see if we have that uh, broken down. The reason I ask is we had rising Delta numbers when Omicron got here, and given the lag time, uh, what's your theory on? what percentage of the severe outcomes we're seeing are Delta versus Omicron? Yeah, well, we certainly saw at the um, early stages of our Omicron wave uh, that we did have that um, uh, overlap uh, of Delta. And so many of our uh, clients in ICU uh, remained uh, Delta, uh, especially at the, at the beginning. We're starting to see that uh, change over time. Again, I don't have the exact numbers of that in front of me, but, uh, but certainly at the early stages of the Omicron, we did see a significant overlap with, uh, with our Delta wave. Dr. Reimer, it's Michelle from CTV. Earlier, you announced uh, that you would want people who are older to get Moderna to save the Pfizer supply for the younger children. Do we have enough Pfizer supply for the second doses and potentially third doses for immunocompromised? Where are you at for supply? So we do have enough Pfizer to provide to everyone under the age of 30 what the doses that they require uh, so long as we continue with our current approach. So even uh, the allocation that we're getting in February would not be high enough that we can provide everybody who might want to have Pfizer at any age uh, a Pfizer dose. Um, but so far with the number of people who have uh, accepted a Moderna dose, despite potentially having Pfizer for dose one and dose two, uh, we have been able to maintain Pfizer for everybody under the age of 30. And uh, if we stay at the same rate, um, we should be okay for February as well. But I wanna make sure people um, who are over the age of 30 um, still continue to uh, accept Moderna because we do need to maintain uh, having many people uh, most people switching to Moderna who had previously received Pfizer. Dr. Rusin, you talked about the uh, change to contact tracing requirements for daycares and the fact that that hasn't been uh, effective. Are we going to see contact tracing in Manitoba ever return to previous levels or, or is this a winding down of the public health response? So uh, like anything, it really is going to depend on what the, what the virus gives us. So with, with Omicron, so infectious, very short incubation period, it's not conducive to, uh, to contact tracing, certainly not in the, in the uh, manner in which we had been doing it. Uh, if we see a, a change in the virus again, then it's, uh, perhaps there, there may be a, a need for it. So right now we're dealing with Omicron 
um, and the nature of this virus uh, is not conducive to uh, widespread contact uh, tracing. Just to follow up to that, Dr. Rusin, uh, I'm sure this change will uh, likely worry some parents, uh, especially those who are maybe sending uh, children too young to be vaccinated to uh, these facilities. Uh, what would you say to them? Because you know that you know for a long time we relied on pretty extensive contact tracing, and now this is winding down. Uh, is there anything you would say to them to kind of you know quell those concerns as this change takes effect on Friday? So I think again, um, reiterating that. Um, uh, uh, certainly, on on average, the, uh, the the this virus has been much less severe in the younger uh, younger ages. So we just don't see that uh, severe outcomes uh, very commonly in in uh, the young uh, children. Uh, we know that the case and contact management is just not effective. Um, so um, it's not really a matter of uh, of scaling it back. It's just it, it's not going to be effective even if we try to do it. Uh, and and then again, the um, uh, we, we've seen that toll on on having kids out of school, uh, out of daycare, that toll on kids and on parents. And this is a, a, a you know a matter of of trying to uh, reduce some of that that burden. So I think we're it's a prudent um, uh, move, and it's uh, you know overall uh, the the level of severity and the and the young uh, children is, is so low. Um, and I think that this is our, our pragmatic move uh, forward. I know a lot of people, uh, parents and experts alike, are concerned about the effects of long COVID in children. And uh, I know, Dr. Reimer, you mentioned that most of the data has to do with adults so far. I, I think the lack of data in some of those younger age groups is concerning people. Uh, how much does that weigh into these decisions uh, when you are dealing with some relative unknowns uh, as far as young people go? Yeah, and so we're again we're looking at the overall uh, health uh, impacts, and so we know that uh, you know certainly COVID has had a significant impact on the health of, of many Manitobans, um, um, but we know there's so much more to uh, to health uh, than than COVID, uh, and there's so much benefit of having uh, these kids in school in care, uh, and so we're trying to weigh all of those uh, factors, and we know that uh, uh, certainly on average um, the risk of severe outcome is much lower in the, in the younger kids. Time for a couple more. Dr. Rusin, how fair would you think it is to say that Manitoba's pandemic management response for the past month can be characterized as really leaving the most vulnerable people out to dry here, given the fact that the people who are disabled, people who don't have access to vaccines, and those are the working poor, despite all efforts, excellent experts by Dr. Reimer, and, 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 the, and the immunocompromised and the elderly. How fair would it be when you hear people say that Manitoba has sort of practiced a, uh, a policy that is letting those people bear the brunt of this? Well, I think we moved quite early on on restrictions. So, I mean, to answer your question, I don't think that's that's fair uh, in any way. Um, Manitoba moved uh, quite early on, uh, you know, on restrictions uh, related to uh, a pending Omicron wave, um, and and really things like case and contact management are just not effective. So that wasn't uh, leaving anyone out uh, out um, to. Uh, 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 out there, just that it wasn't uh, going to be an effective approach to this uh, uh, variant. Uh, and then certainly, like you mentioned, uh, uh, vaccines uh, have been available. There's been a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous uptake by Manitobans on that. Uh, and we still had many other uh, uh, tools uh, in our uh, repertoire against uh, against this uh, virus. So, uh, so certainly there's uh, restrictions in place um, and uh, we responded to, uh, to Omicron. You have restrictions in place, but to be fair, if you look at Quebec and Ontario, and Quebec having, you know, the, the, the worst Omicron wave and the highest death rate, but Manitoba having the highest hospitalization rate. Uh, if you look at Quebec and Ontario, they really did go further than us. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think that there's been a varied response and varied timing throughout uh, much of the pandemic related to, um, uh, you know, local uh, local factors. 
Um, you know, you, you mentioned those provinces and compare it, but, uh, you know, compare it to Western provinces, we have been more strict in many aspects. So, so there's lots of variability um, uh, out there. Uh, and, and then now we see that uh, those provinces are moving to, uh, to loosen uh, restrictions as well. And so um, it's really hard to compare uh, across provinces with different timing, with different, uh, different settings. Do you feel your current personal pandemic management philosophy has been challenged by the existing political leadership? You know, I mean, I don't know about uh, the, the the fairness of uh, of that question. Right? We um, uh, public health receives input from many uh, settings. We have many public health experts, epidemiologists that provide um, a variety of inputs. And there's a lot of variability on those recommendations that come to me. Uh, and then I work with many stakeholders, including government, to, uh, to try to provide the best, uh, best advice um, moving forward. And so it's, um, uh, uh, it's a challenging time. Uh, and it's really hard to break down everyone, the success of everyone's response, simply based on the strictness of, of the restrictions. So it's, uh, uh, it certainly has been, uh, been a challenging time. Any other questions? One last question. Hi, uh, Taylor Brock here. Hi. Oh. Well, um, what's being done right now to track and treat long haul symptoms? So at this point, that's not something that's reported reportable to public health. It's not a reportable illness. So so public health doesn't receive regular reports on that. There are um, you know acute care providers that uh, are operating clinics um, in, in that regard, uh, but public health doesn't uh, receive this as a as a reportable illness. It's Michelle from CTV. I'm wondering if uh, the way we report cases generally, like we get them daily and then over the weekend, would that potentially change as well? Uh, you know, again, as we uh, look at our overall response, um, as we're starting to move forward with, uh, um, you know, with this, uh, our overall response to, to Omicron, things like that may change, uh, you know, we'll certainly provide details if we have any plans to do so. So right now we don't have anything uh, immediately pending in that regard. Dr. Roussin, Dr. Reimer, um, concerning the use of rapid tests, um, how many positive cases do you estimate uh, are not being reported in Manitoba due to the use of rapid tests? Yeah, this is really hard to say. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, when we look at uh, things in the past, we would see that even in our other waves uh, after uh, um, uh, seroprevalence studies, we saw that maybe we were diagnosing one in four uh, cases. Certainly with Omicron being so much more widespread, so much more infectious, it's, uh, you know, it's a multiple of that. Um, but it's, uh, it's tough to, to pinpoint what that would be. Thank you, doctors. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our Zoom session.